cigarette lighter. I'm an odd smoker, but I use it to uh, light incense sticks that I uh, deodorize my house with. Two cats, one of them male, non-neutered. You do the math. I know someone's going to say that that's evidence that I'm a covert Buddhist, but there you are. I'll just have to live with that millstone around my neck. Um, it's very useful to understand the fundamental nature of fire. You uh, strike uh, a flame, and you've unlocked one of the elemental forces of nature. With this little lighter, you can destroy the whole house. You can do a lot of damage. I have to learn at a very early age that this thing is dangerous. It's very useful, but it's also dangerous. So kids get burned, they find out that it's dangerous, and they learn to treat this with respect. Um, I was one of those kids that I really liked to play with matches, and I did get burned a couple of times, very mildly, but when you're a kid that hurts a lot, and you learn something out of it. Um, <clears throat> that's, I think, part of the learning experience of being a human being. The mentally ill person, or a symptom of a certain type of mental illness, is um, to strike a flame, hold your hand over it, do that a lot. That's not good. I think most of us would agree that that's not productive. I can see in some spiritual or intellectual way making some kind of a exercise out of doing it, but I think that we agree that most people that deliberately do this are doing something that is going to harm them. Uh, they're beyond the point of needing to learn anything about the destructiveness or the potential destructiveness of fire. They're just doing something that has no net effect but increasing their level of harm. <clears throat> now, uh, Zapfi's phenomenon of isolation. Here's how he defines it. By isolation, I here mean a fully arbitrary dismissal from consciousness, all disturbing and destructive thought and feeling. Engstrom, little parenthetical uh, addition, one should not think it is just confusing. A perfect and almost brutalizing variant is found among certain physicians who for self-protection will only see the technical aspect of their profession. It can also decay to pure hooliganism. As among petty thugs and medical students, where any sensitivity to the tra tragic side of life is eradicated by violent means, football played with cadaver heads and so on. I once worked in a morgue. Uh, laws actually are very strict concerning fiddling with corpses, but uh, you'd be surprised uh, how much macabre humor takes place in morgues. In any case... <clears throat> Zapfi says, a fully arbitrary dismissal from consciousness. Is it arbitrary to dismiss from consciousness uh, thoughts and feelings that are no longer of any value to you? I would say that it's not arbitrary at all. In fact, if such thoughts and feelings are doing you damage, it is less than arbitrary. In fact, it makes sense to not pursue such thoughts. That's not the ostrich response. Any more than not holding my hand over this lighter is the ostrich response. Some of my emotions, some of my negative emotions are useful. They teach me to act more sensibly. Um, you learn that in adolescence with the phenomenon of puppy love. You just go head over heels into something that you understand very little about, i.e. human beings, and you get badly burned. <clears throat> As you get older, you get better at um, 
forming relationships with uh, people that you want to partner up with and things get saner and the roller coaster gets a lot more flat um, you learn that it's not good to approach things in a certain way emotionally because of the crazy risks involved it doesn't turn you against the idea of relationships it doesn't turn you well I suppose it does in some people but it doesn't turn you against the idea of having any emotions at all it just learn it just teaches you to make sure that you're more of a master of your emotions than a slave to your emotions it teaches you to um, control yourself and understand the effect of uh, unleashing literally or you know I mean unleashing, taking the leash off the uh, the emotion and letting it run riot. Um, it can lead you to places where you don't want to be. So we do understand that a certain degree of control of one's thoughts is necessary to prevent damage. We understand that it is necessary to prevent our mind from going in certain directions because it's no longer productive to go there. Um, the depressed mind often gets obsessed with things like harm, self-harm, suicide, um, seeing other people suffer, even if you would not harm anyone for the world. Um, I was plagued by all these thoughts when I was in my deeper recesses of depression. Uh, if I sat here and recounted all the thoughts that I had on a regular basis, I, I think most people would find it quite disturbing. Um, it's healthy for me to know what's going to happen if I fall in front of a speeding train. It's a little bit, it's gone a little bit beyond that when every time I stand in front of the subway train waiting for my train to show up, I imagine myself being mashed to a pulp on the tracks. <laughs> that's uh, that's a bit much, but that happened to me regularly. Um, it's uh, it's useful for me to know that it's dangerous, that I have to stand way back. But if I repeatedly go over in my mind what will happen if I don't stand way back, uh, well back behind the yellow line, and I repeatedly go over this in my head in graphic detail of what is going to happen to me if I don't um, if I don't treat this with proper respect it's not healthy refusing to deliberately engage in pointlessly self-destructive thoughts is not what I would call a fully arbitrary dismissal from consciousness of all disturbing and destructive thought and feeling it's not <laughs> Um, you have to bring in some destructive and negative thought and feeling. It's like, as I say, it Im immunizes you against, um, or it acts as an immunizing agent against uh, certain harms that can come to you psychologically, mentally, emotionally. Um, but obsessing on them a little, uh, obsessing on them too much, they become toxic. Um, I am aware that I'm sitting on a tiny speck in an obscure corner of the universe uh, called the Earth that could be smashed to atoms at any given moment by some gigantic object, or even not oh, not so gigantic comparatively, hurtling randomly through space. That, you know, yeah, okay, <laughs> that could happen. Um, constantly reminding myself of that is a bit crazy. A, I can't do anything about it, even if uh, even if I do know or I think about the fact that this is coming. Um, and uh, B, um, it's going to happen anyway. <laughs> so constantly thinking about it, uh, especially when it's something I can't even predict. I don't know whether or not it's going to happen, and by the time I know that it's going to happen, it's too late. Um, if I constantly live my life that way, with the shield over my head... <clears throat> then um, that becomes unproductive. That, uh, not thinking about that is not an arbitrary dismissal of anything. It's just, it doesn't make sense for me to constantly remind myself of this. 
there's a no, an enormous amount of suffering in the world. Okay, I understand that, and I, you know, it, compassion is something that we as a society have decided correctly, if you ask me, uh, is a good thing. Compassion is good. You should have empathy for all the suffering in this world. But empathize with all the suffering in the world and watch what happens. Empathize with the suffering of the world 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Straight jacket, here we come. Empathy keeps you human, and empathy um, allows you to sort of dignify your own suffering. Because you empathize with the suffering of others, you can dignify your own suffering, and because you dignify your own suffering, you can cope with it better. That's not arbitrary. <laughs> when I decide that I'm not going to spend my entire life thinking about what it must be like living in a third world slum, um, I'm not dismissing anything. I'm fully aware of the plight of the people that are living there, and I have compassion for them. But the amount of suffering in this world, if I decided to obsess on it constantly, would cause my brain to seize up. We have to have a certain degree of isolation. We have to separate ourselves to a certain extent from the horrors of this world. Otherwise, this starts to go bad. This starts to malfunction. We start to feel and experience the harms and the sufferings of the entire world. It's not useful. It's not productive. It is not beneficial to have too much compassion or to have too much concern about potential harms that might befall us. This I have to say, unless I misunderstand something that Zapfi is getting at, I have to say that I disagree with him. I agreed with a lot of what he said in, in what he writes, I still do, but I have to say that um, in this one, I think I have to disagree. It does us no good to overemphasize the sufferings or the harms in this planet, on, on, in this plane of existence. It's just as lopsided as completely ignoring all of it and pretending like it's not there. Some sort of a balance, I think, is in order. And isolation is something that anyone who's ever attempted to control a major depression has to learn to do. It's the hardest of all things to do when you're uh, a depressed individual. You have to, rather than just block off your emotions, which causes depression, you have to learn to experience your emotions in a proper way. You have to ride a fine line between um, too much and too little feeling. A certain degree of distance is not only essential, but it's healthy, and I would say it's actually morally the right thing to do. Watch what happens to people when they dwell too much on the suffering, on the painful side of life. Thank you.